introduce Peter Forbes as a, as a guest speaker at a, at a signature event. And I could introduce Peter by um, describing the fact that uh, for much of his career, he was a senior professional, professional for the Trust for Public Land in New England and probably did more land deals than most anyone now practicing land conservation in New England. Um, but that's really only part of Peter's story, and it's um, only a very small part of why I believe that now, today, is the most important time for him to be speaking to us as an organization. So I first encountered Peter um, with a discovery in the upper left-hand drawer of the big steel desk that I inherited from Dick. You remember that desk? It was a monster. <laughs> you left a lot of stuff in there, by the way. Um, <laughs> And in there was a CD of um, recorded conversations. And on the cover of the CD were these people, a photograph of these people sitting in sort of loose clothing in a yurt um, talking to one another. I was a little skeptical about this, as you might imagine. And um, one of those people was, was Peter Forbes, who was a name I was starting to hear more and more about. But um, I didn't think a whole lot of it and, and put it back in the, the drawer and never listened to it. And little did I know that two years later, um, despite my, my skepticism, I'd be sitting in a circle in that very same yurt with Peter and about a dozen other young conservation professionals experiencing at that time some of the most powerful emotions my work in conservation has ever caused me to feel. The place was and is the Center for Whole Communities at Knoll Farm. In, uh, uh, perched above the Mad River Valley in Vermont, a um, place uh, that Peter co-founded and still uh, and lives at and uh, still teaches at frequently. And it, I was there for a retreat uh, for young professionals called 2042 Today, which was named for the year when demographers predict that the current majority population of the United States will flip and become the minority. And as a result, as an implication for land conservation, all the tried and true messages that we use to speak to the traditional constituency of land conservation uh, may not be the right ones anymore. And we'll be faced with a, a challenge of a very different, um, much more diverse public um, that perhaps is not uh, a di as dialed into some of those original reasons for conservation. And we were there, frankly, to figure out what we were going to do with that um, and how we were going to plan ahead for that time and do it right. <coughs> parts of that week were um, really inspiring and parts of them, frankly, were, were unsettling too, but in a, in a really important way. And I'm so tempted to delve right into the substance of what I anticipate Peter will say today, uh, because I believe in it so much myself, but I won't, because I think, as you'll find, he's going to do it uh, a whole lot more beautifully and eloquently than I ever could. Peter Forbes is a writer, a photographer, a farmer, a father, a wood carver, but more than anything, I believe that Peter is a collector and teller of stories. And so I invite you to listen to the stories that Peter is likely to tell us today with an open mind and an open heart. I invite you to feel maybe just a little unsettled, as I was, if only for the novelty of seeing something differently. Most importantly, I invite you to be inspired by what we can do in the next 25, 50, 100 years of this work, and by what is already happening all around us and even by us. I give you Peter Forbes. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Good, good. Um, what an honor it is to be here with all of you at this time of, of celebrating. I have a huge, unlimited amount of respect for Ben and for Dick, uh, and I happen to know that there's a good deal of, of friendship and mentorship between them and between them and Ryan. Uh, and I'm here today because I really wanted to stand alongside Ryan. I wanted to stand alongside Ryan and his staff and his board uh, as they make that step, as you made that step into uh, the future, which I think is incredibly exciting for conservation here. At its core, the possibility to do the most important thing, which I think simply is just to help us to live and die uh, healthy, full, beautiful lives in a beautiful, healthy place. And I know because of all the work you've done that you're, you're well on your way to that. Um, 
I do have some things that I want to share with you, and my, my practice is photography, so I'm going to share it through that medium. Ryan asked me to help think with you about the next 25 years. If 100 years from now there are wild places for kids to roam, and black bear and fisher cat, and our towns still have rural character, but also rural characters, and there are still people who cling to the land, it will be because of conservation, no doubt. It will be because of your work and the new relationships you sought to create in the years ahead with Ryan and his staff and the board. So you are uh, the defenders and stewards, and I know this because I, I am a New Englander. You are the defenders and stewards of one of the most beautiful places in our region. And your commitment to that place matches its beauty. And I honor that, and I thank that in you. But of course, it's not just the natural world alone that creates that beauty here. What also creates that beauty is the relationship between people in this place. And I try really, really hard, as Ryan said, to be a student of that relationship, whether it's in Nepal or the coast of Maine with homesteaders or, or ranchers in the American West or urban gardeners, and, and I myself am a farmer. So from all of that, the questions that come up to me <laughs> is this. You remember those phones? <laughs> How will Monadnock Conservancy need to innovate in the next 25 years in service to that mission? How might that future be different from the previous 25 years? You've been enormously, enormously successful in addressing a generation's challenge of how to protect and live well in a place. That's a beautiful thing. It's a wise thing. It's a hard thing. But I think an even wiser, harder challenge is, what is the next generation's challenge? What can we do now to set that challenge in place? So I want to share some stories with you that may help you in your own way to think about evolution and innovation. I want to introduce you to uh, first this man, one of my most important friends and elders. Um, I was talking to Howard outside and he mentioned being in this hall many, many years ago, and it was filled when Helen Nearing came and spoke here. I don't know if anyone else was here then. This is Bill Copperthwaite. Bill is, was Helen and Scott Nearing's best friend. When Helen and Scott Nearing were in their 90s and 70s, Bill was in his 30s. More than anyone else, Bill taught me about the possibilities of a healthy human relationship in, to land and nature, and he literally took me from a boy born deep, deep in a consumer culture in Fairfield County, Connecticut. And he helped me to grow into a man living in a maker culture who understood how to use his hands, how to live in a place, and what it really means to conserve land. And that's incredibly important to me. Bill and I collaborated on a book together 10 years ago called A Handmade Life. And he and I were working on the sequel to that in last November when he died in a car accident, just like Helen Nearing did. I want to read to you a letter that Bill wrote to his sister when he was just 25 years old, okay? So take this in. Bill is a homesteader on the coast of Maine. Uh, he first in his family to go to college. All of his sisters are married to military men. It's the eve of the Korean War. He gets a free ride to Annapolis, and he turns it down. I want to read to you uh, what he said to his sister. This is a hard letter to write, but I'll do my best. You seem to feel that I am acting rashly and without having thought this through. Believe me, this is not the case. You can't read that. My duty in this situation has been considered and thought on almost constantly for many months. More thought has gone into this decision than any other in my life. So it hurts to have you who understands me best think that I have acted irresponsibly. 
Some think my decision to be a conscientious objector is a position of cowardice. I do not think you feel that I am a coward. For it is much more difficult to do what you feel is right when your family and friends do not understand and believe you are acting wrongly than it is to go as a soldier. Most strongly, you feel that I have been selfish, holding to my ideals when they cause pain to mom and others. Now, you may be right, but I've thought about this a great, great deal. This thought has bothered me more than all the others. I cannot bring myself to feel that mom would want me to do what I believe to be wrong, dishonest or unjust. To do so would be to negate all that she has done and taught me. In due reverence to her, I cannot do other than what I believe to be right and good. So why I wanted you to hear Bill's words as a 25-year-old is because it really helps us to answer this question. What today do we care about enough to take such a stand for? Because I think the people who created this land trust took a stand for the things that were difficult at that time. No one knew what a conservation easement was. No one knew what any of that was about. And now it's more mainstream, but they had to take a big stand. So my answer to that personally is actually these things. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't mean dolphins and whales specifically, although those things are really, really magical to me. I mean the great diversity of life. I mean the beauty of all creatures, including humans, including humans with whom we share this worth, this earth. This diversity of life is what shapes us, makes us who we are, and that is what I stand for. And I think you all stand for this also. So I would like you to put aside every nice thing that Ryan said in his introduction of me and consider this instead. This is what I really am, or this is who I really am. Bull Run Farm. Sage's Ravine, Spruce Knob, Dickinson's Reach, Heron's Rip. Musalak, Arun River Valley, Central Harlem, Cedar Mesa, Chama River, Arch Rock, Drake's Beach, Lake Atitlan, Knoll Farm, right there. That's me. <laughs> these words, these places, they tell my story. They are the waters, the food, the wood, the dreams, the memories that literally make up this character in front of you. These places define me, and I am that alchemy of land and people and story. But this is also my story. I am the youngest son of a Jewish immigrant, this man who came here from poverty and a city in the Ukraine. He arrived here with a different name, speaking a different language, and this was his first experience of America what it looked like from the boat as it was coming in the East River. This is one of the few, I have many, many things from my father. This is one of the few material possessions that I have of his. His experience of America and of nature would be very, very different from mine, and he gave me this. He gave me an appreciation of the wild. He gave me Outward Bound and Knowles courses. He made me a conservationist. His legacy makes it impossible for me to think about that and to think about place without also asking myself, place for whom? Place for whom? And I can't think about that without thinking about this really, really important word, querencia. How many of you know that word? Yeah, it's a really valuable word for all of us who care about land and place to know. It's a mestizo word, which means it comes actually from Jewish culture, from North Africa and into the United States and the Southwest. I had this word defined for me by Estevan Ariano, who is a cultural anthropologist in the Southwest. So take this in, okay? This one word, Querencia means these things. The tendency of humans 
to return to where they were born. This one word means affection and responsibility. It means the space where one feels secure. It means the place of one's memories. And this, is, uh, this last one is powerful to me. It also means the tendency to love and be loved. All of those things wrapped up into one word, one powerful word. And that word, like many others, in, like it in other languages, Kuliani in native Hawaiian, means both the, uh, the stalk of the taro plant as well as community. Okay? All of those suggests that our affection and responsibility to one another, to community, has always been intimately connected to our relationship to place. Always. So this is what I stand for. Querencia doesn't exist for some people. It exists for my father, too. It exists for all people. The land and nature welcomes bankers and farmers, people in business suits, and, and people in torn car hearts. The land doesn't care, and you know this if you're young or old, brown or white, year-round resident or second homer, does it? Our biology is hardwired to it. And to care about the land and nature is not a Republican thing, it's not a Democrat thing. You know, to care is not even reserved for conservationists, and that's really important. To care is not even reserved for conservationists. To care is simply human. And that caring is what I take a stand for, and I think you do too. The interconnectedness between respect of nature and respect of each other is the most important and least understood story of the movement that we're all part of. So the guy here with the binoculars, Aldo Leopold, the author of Sand County Almanac, one of the books that, that got me excited about conservation, the guy who really understood the connection between health of land and health of people. He, this, this guy was part biologist and part sociologist. He, this was his, his chart. This was his understanding that health of economy, health of culture, health of land, health of people, it's all one story. It's all one story, one system. He saw that, that people and nature together the health of our one is directly connected to the health of the other. Part one is really easy to understand. People need healthy land, healthy forests, healthy oceans to become healthy themselves. We got that down, right? Richard Louvre got us to understand how most children need nature to, to grow up leading productive, healthy lives. We understand that. But Leopold was going further, much further. And what he was saying is difficult and sometimes provocative. When we are disconnected from nature, we will also always hurt. CJ, do you mind tapping that there? Thank you. Maybe I can get out of it here. The code there. Um, when we are disconnected from nature, we will hurt ourselves, thank you, and we will hurt nature itself. Because we are the keystone species, right? We're the dominant dog. When we're disconnected from that whole, it's not just bad for us. It's not just bad for us, it's bad for the entire system. And this is how we hurt ourselves. We become greedy. We become fearful of the other. We become forgetful of what's reality. We become susceptible to spells and lies and myths. And we always hurt ourselves as much as we hurt the land, every time. When we are fearful of each other, we put up walls between neighborhoods and walls between nations. People suffer, the land suffers. When we oppress each other, we feel more licensed to oppress the land. When we are at war, absolutely, nature dies too. But in a much less dramatic sense, right, and in an everyday sense, the more disconnected we are to nature, the more we struggle to find meaning from other things. We think meaning comes from wealth and from consumption, and that too hurts the land. We use the land, we tear it up, and then we lie to ourselves and say, you know, heck, it doesn't matter. 
And under those conditions, and this is the part that's hard for me to say, there is no sign and no law that is big enough or strong enough that's going to stop people who don't know about the land from hurting it. So it's the caring part that we need to focus on. How do we help and encourage a great diversity of people who live here to care about this place? We have to help them to feel like they belong, that they are welcome here. I stand for that. And don't get me wrong, I, I'm not a simpleton advocating, you know, thou shalt not uh, post your land or love thy neighbor. You can't always love your neighbor. And sometimes land ought to be posted, no trespassing. What I'm trying to say is that our relationship to nature and place ought to be like a marriage. A few marriages that exist only on paper last very long, right? My marriage... Should I really talk about my marriage? <laughs> Let me pause for a moment. <laughs> I will say this. My marriage has long, long moments of love, like this day when we were married on our land. And it also has long moments of misunderstanding and hurt. But I'm committed to it for the long haul. I want us to be committed to that relationship between people and the land for the long haul. I want to tell you a, a story about that. Many of you might recognize this guy, Michael Pollan, right? He's the guy who wrote many, many food books, been on the New York Times bestseller list for a long, long time. Before he became a food writer, he was on the editorial board of the New York Times, and his assignment in 2000, and obviously many years before 2000, was to figure out the New York Times time capsule. They wanted to create a ta time capsule that would be opened in a thousand years. And they spent all kinds of time and, and brain power and money deciding what should go into that capsule, but their toughest decision was where to place the time capsule, how to protect this time capsule for a thousand years. What would really protect it for that long? Do they bury it in the ground uh, like a dog does with a bone? You know, strangely enough, that's what we have done. Well, time capsules are strange things anyway, right? But <laughs> you think of biological diversity as a much more potent time capsule. But our culture loves time capsules, and mostly what we've done is bury them in the ground. Or they thought maybe we should create a law from Congress that legislates future generations to protect it. Or, or maybe what we ought to do is raise a ton of money to endow 20 generations of stewards who wear fancy different cloaks and they stand guard around this time capsule and check on it every few years or so. Does that sound familiar? So each one of those very plausible solutions for how to protect this time capsule for a thousand years was examined by the, the high and mighty of the New York Times, and each one of them was discarded. Then they asked themselves a very helpful question. What existed a thousand years before that still exists today? What are the answers? Land for sure. Some things of culture. Some things that have been made uh, by humans, and some things not. What they felt in terms of institutions, the two things that had been around in a big way were the Catholic Church and forms of art. And this being the New York Times, they went with the forms of art. <laughs> so they hired the very best uh, Italian designer, and they designed this beautiful, beautiful sculpture that you probably, many of you, have walked past Many times, it's right outside the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. I've seen dogs lifting their legs on it. I've seen kids playing on it. There's been so many millions of pictures of kids taken on that thing. And only at the very bottom do you see a little plaque that says, please open this in the year 3000. Hmm. The best way to protect something for a thousand years is to help people to feel connected to it that they belong to it, to love it. And I, I don't think here I'm being naive. I, I, know, I know what the problems are. And I know who's responsible. You know, we, we've transformed a third to half of the Earth's surface. 
Most of the world's major rivers have been dammed. A quarter of all the mammals are headed to extinction. In our native New England, on my farm, climate change is driving maples north at the rate of eight feet per hour. So I'm not naive. How do we make this profound work of conservation last a thousand years? Do you believe that laws are going to make it last for a hundred years or even two hundred years? I want to be honest with you and say that I do not. I think that our laws alone are insufficient. I think they're important, but insufficient. I believe that what's going to protect into the distant future what we value, what I value today, is our efforts to help future generations to connect what we love in their own way, in their own image. What will get us to perpetuity that Ryan was talking about is not laws alone, but relationships. And this is the truth, too, that future generations won't look like us or think like us, and that's okay. It's the only way it could be. I want to involve them, welcome people, trust them, not simply try to write a really, really tight conservation easement that they can't get out of. If over the next two decades, two and a half decades, we can put our greatest energies into connecting people to this landscape around how they live and work and play, then I'm really excited, and I, I bet you are too, to pass that baton on to someone we don't know. We can't know them, and they're not going to look like us. And I want to be able to say to her, I trust you, that you will care for this place as I have cared for it. But it's scary, right, because it's out of our control. And it's unbelievably exciting, too, because there are lots of really cool, successful efforts that are making this come alive here in, in New Hampshire and around the world. Imagine that there's a land trust that does all the conservation work that you might expect, but it also owns and operates a 400-acre working farm which feeds year-round 700 families, takes food stamps for a third of those families, and is responsible for growing the land trust's annual membership by 300% over the last decade. Imagine there's another land trust that gets a quarter of its $1.2 million budget from area hospitals who believe that its recreational trails are literally medicine for its patients. Imagine that there is a, a land trust with such a strong public vision for the use of their land that it's been designated by the public school system as the lead community partner in how to educate the young and old. Imagine there's a land trust that gets why some in their community think that they are elitist and in response sells portions of their conserved timberlands to cooperatives of low-income people who need the firewood. They need the firewood to heat their home, but they also need the benefits of land ownership in order to live and die healthy lives in a healthy whole place. Imagine there's a group of land trusts who pool all their money and their smarts and they conserve 20,000 acres, but they also co collaborate with their community to create a rural recovery plan. And they endow a local charter school and they do job training and they create a small business loan fund. So, I think you know where that's going. You don't have to imagine any of that, right? Right. <laughs> it's all happening right now. Everything I've described is happening by a land trust. This is land trust becoming larger public citizens. And when you own or control 30% of a state, as conservationists do here in New Hampshire, of course, of course, the public expects you to be a caring public citizen about things that matter to them, even if they are not in your mission statement. So imagine these possibilities in southwestern New Hampshire. Imagine a nine-year-old boy in elementary school who walks up to the milk dispenser in his school cafeteria and pours into his glass milk that his own family produced. Imagine that if all the public schools in New Hampshire were serving locally grown food and heated by local wood, that you had mapped your forest to know how you could heat half of the homes in this region forever. 
Better than that, even imagine how if you'd figured out how to use sun and wind and water to become a net producer of energy. Imagine if your land trust was so connected to the community that you maintained one tract of land just to grow firewood for people in town who needed it. Imagine you had worked with NOFA here and the Farm Bureau to figure out how much land would be needed actually to produce one third of all the food that you eat. Imagine that every kid growing up here went to a great public school that got them outside, gave them space to build forts, made it common knowledge when the robins return, you know, when the sap was flowing, what phase of the moon that we're in. Imagine that every logger and fisherman and carpenter knew that their kid had the option of doing the same exact work if they wanted to because the forests and the oceans and the community were healthy, and that that work was respected. That, I think, is what's going to keep conservation alive and in, in perpetuity 200 years from now. So I showed you this picture of Classy Parker earlier because she's one of the people Work, or spend that money buying land in, in the North Woods. And I learned a lot about the power of land to different people living in different places. And she helped me to stretch my thinking about what conservation means to different people. Who might this person be for you in your community? I think for Jean Themy in Swansea, it was Mike Johnson. And I heard about a little bit about Mike from Gene, an old-fashioned farmer with lots of skills and abilities who Gene connected with and, and came to respect a great deal. I could feel, as she was telling me the story, I could feel the influence of Mike on Gene when she said to me, and I'm quoting her, if people feel connected, they're going to protect the land without anyone telling them to do it, unquote. Jean calls her way of uh, building new allies backdoor conservation because neighbors who trust one another use the back door or the kitchen door, not the front door. And, and for Ryan here, you know, I think it's about getting the widest possible cast of characters caring about conservation in their own way, using their own tools. And what results from finding new allies is the possibility for much bigger, more successful work because we don't have to do it on our own anymore. Ken Ju, who works on mental health issues in Keene, asks, and I'm quoting him here, what's your land trust role in improving children's emotional health? This sounds so grandiose, this is Ken's words, this sounds so grandiose and unanswerable and off your mission, but it can actually be answered if you find the right partners. Let us work with you, end quote. So community conservation is about finding a role you can feel good about in helping your community. And to say yes shows that we have empathy, that we care about what someone else cares about, not just what we care about. All of these examples, all of these boil down to one thing, listening, not selling. When you control or own 30% of a state, the graceful thing to do is to listen an awful lot. And great community conservation is, is about listening to hear what a community needs and then finding the sweet spot where their need and your expertise overlaps. So here's an example of one way the conservation, the conservation might go, conversation might go. I believe deeply in con conservation. I have a conservation plan that's going to enrich your life, allow me to share and con convince you of what I believe in. And here's uh, the alternative conversation. What do you believe in and need? 
How can what Monadnock Conservancy do so well fulfill what you care about? And let's, let's do this together. I, I know that that has been the hallmark of the Conservancy for the last 25 years. How will you ramp that up? Who will you have those conversations? What's working really, really well is meeting people on their own turf, leaving your assumptions at the door about what they need or you need, being open to new ground being discovered between you, thinking about the relationship, not just the transaction, and honoring that other side. We're making really, really good progress as a community of conservationists, but what worries me still is our reliance on a set of tools that is so much more about the power of the stick than about the sweet taste of the carrot. We spend an awful lot of time saying no. I think we have to be for things alternatively to make real progress. To what can we say, yes, yes, yes? <laughs> And how can that story include so many other people? How can so many others see them in that story? And it needs to be a story that excites and draws people in. Maybe, maybe the place to start is as simple as regularly sitting down with someone you don't know and having a cup of coffee. Ask them what they care about and how we can help. At the, core, at the core of what I'm talking about is the simple effort of helping very, very different people to take their best step toward one another. I think that conservation has a huge role to play in that. And that's when our work goes beyond just conserving land, but helping people to see one another I believe more than ever in what you do, providing people with a relationship to land and nature, it is still medicine, medicine for what most ails our nation, our state. Our healthy relationships to place are the means still, in, in 2004, still, it is how we all generate and recreate and renew all the big transcendent values like beauty, and responsibility, and, and love. I think these things create a nation. I really do. And I think they make a state, and they make a region, and they make a healthy, whole community. I want you to think of that letter Bill wrote to his family and consider in that light, what are you most willing to take a stand for in the next 25 years? You might be really, really surprised to learn that there are a whole lot of others who share your feelings, though they do not use the words you may use. And they may not look anything like us. I think, I think that there are many, many thousands of people who live right here, who love this land, and may now be, or, or perhaps, perhaps they have forever been, on the edges of town or the edges of mainstream culture, there by choice or not, but who feel strangers in their own community today. They feel left out of economic progress for whatever reason. They are folks who were here first, or they were folks who came last. They are people who work with their hands in a world that works with their heads, or folks simply on the on the losing end of a, of a demographic trend. It's not that I'm asking you to do conservation just for them. I'm asking us to do conservation that never forgets them. To do so would, for me, be to forget my father. I don't know exactly what the answers are for you, but I do know very, very clearly what the answers sound like. Cooper Hill, Great Brook, 
Shattuck Farm, Tippin Rock, Porcupine Falls, Cranberry Meadow, Temple Mountain, The Whirlpool, Monadnock, Nubanusit, Haunted Lake, Wildcat Hollow, Rattlesnake Mountain, Henniker, Goshen, Stoddard, Saxons River, and Unity. Thank you all so much for what you do.